You are listening to the REI Mastermind Podcast. Join JD as he chats with industry-leading real estate experts and professionals. We learn from their experience and uncover the strategies to their success that we can implement into our own businesses and we can drive immediate results today. They share their experience and wisdom as we build the foundation to our own success. This is the REI Mastermind Network. We have Kim Daly on the call tonight. Kim, I appreciate you joining us. And we're going to cover a new topic for us. This is kind of exciting, so I'm looking forward to this. But Kim, before we even start, I warned you, uh, I'd like to start off with your contact information. So if people are interested in contacting you or, or following along, where would they hit you up? Okay, it's the Daily Coach. That's my last name, D A L Y, the Daily Coach.com backslash dudes. <laughs> oh, yeah, we have a URL. So, no, I appreciate that. Well, I really wanted to talk to you here tonight because you have franchise opportunities and, and this is something that's that's always eluded me and I'm I'm kind of interested in talking about this because I am like really fresh to the subject. So we might go off on a variety of in different directions here tonight. But um, you really focus on finding franchise opportunities for people who are looking for to diversify, especially when it comes to their investments, right? Correct. Yes. I am a franchise consultant and <clears throat> people come to me who are either in career transition or investors who are looking for uh, diversification from their current maybe uh, types of uh, investments like real estate or the stock market, or maybe they have infinite banking policies and they're looking for some place to use that money. Mm -hmm. And I help them select the right business by matching them to opportunities that fit their background, their interests, their financial capabilities, their risk tolerances, their exit strategy. So I get to know my candidates and then I select businesses for them based on this model that we build of them and their kind of ideal business and their future goals. Sure. So can you give us some examples of like what type of businesses are we talking about here? Oh, sure. So a franchise business in general, obviously, is a business where there's already a proven business plan. Mm -hmm. I work with big brands that you may know, like Supercuts or Meineke or um, like Hand in Stone, which is like a massage envy. I work with um, businesses that many people don't even know are franchises, like water and restoration companies, plumbing companies, flooring companies, window treatment companies expense reduction companies, staffing companies. So there are lots of different businesses that operate in the franchise model, where mm -hmm. the franchise model being where franchisees are trained by a corporate office and supported by a corporate office. Um, and, and the business owner, the franchisee just gets to show up and execute on that business plan rather than stopping and trying to figure out how to make money. Franchisees buy into a proven system that comes with the proven business plan and the infrastructure that allows the owner then to start executing and making money rather than the entrepreneur who has to stop and figure out how to make money. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. In fact, you know, um, when it comes to real estate investing, I, I usually make the correlation that especially when people are getting into real estate investing for that first time and they're looking for a real estate investing mentor, yeah. in a way they're kind of buying into a franchise. You're, you're finding a coach that already has been there, done that, provides you the processes and procedures, and you're really just executing on the plan. Exactly. That's exactly what you get in the beginning of a franchise. The additional bonus of the franchise is that collectively you're working together to build a national brand. Right. So like if, if somebody was interested in this type of thing, like how, how would they decide if they were a, a good candidate? Like what, what type of person are you looking for that's such a great question. So I love anybody who's interested in learning about franchising. I do not discriminate. 
<laughs> so <laughs> sometimes people will say, well, Kim, I don't know if I have enough money. I'm like, I don't care. Let's just spend some time together. Let me educate you. Uh, because through my process, very quickly, we're going to figure out if you have enough money to invest in a business that matches what you're looking to, to do and the kind of owner that you want to be. So there are various levels of entry in franchising. The more money you have, the more options you have, right? Like anything else in life. But money is probably the first qualifier if you will. Right. So, um, I, but I never talk about money in open. I want that one-on-one -on -one with people so that I have the opportunity to educate them. I never, in 18 years, I've never sent anyone away saying, well, sorry, you don't have enough money. I can't help you. Instead, I invest time with people to help them understand what money buys and send them away inspired and encouraged so they know what they need to do financially and when mm -hmm. to call me back. Right. So right. I'm like a farmer working the land. I don't, I'm not a hunter. I don't have to eat, eat what I kill today. Right. So I'll, I'll, I'll help people nurture people along. So two, three, four, five years from now, when they're ready, they can call me and we can start looking at companies. Right. No, that, that's a great, just good mindset to begin with. You know, one of the things that you pointed out early on that I think is really interesting, and I think that's a misunderstanding, is that a lot of when people hear franchise, at least for me, I would think of fast food places, you know, something like that. But you really had a lot of diversification there in the list that you, you mentioned. Yes. I mean, plumbing and all of that. I mean, that's, I wouldn't have thought of any of that. It's so great. So I'm one of the top consultants in the country, which means I help a lot of people say yes to their dreams to own a franchise. And I very rarely ever show food. Like people have to beg me for food. <laughs> I just know there are faster, easier, better ways to make money. Food, for every sandwich you make, you have an expense. I always love businesses that have low fixed costs. So even if people aren't coming in, you're not bleeding to keep your doors open. And for every widget that you send out, you don't have a big cost of good. Now, that's not entirely true because I love flooring companies and I love California closets and I love, you know, businesses that have a tangible product that have a cost of goods. But the difference is that there's still a big margin. Um, in what you're selling. So most of the people I'm working with are first time business owners and, you know, working with a business that has a very tight margin can be um, just really, really stressful. Mm -hmm. And in this year, 2020, we've seen that, you know, um, life can change and um, doors can be closed and we need, we need to be able to adapt. And these franchisors that I work with have adapted their businesses in unbelievable ways. And these businesses that I love to show to people that are kind of like the diamond in the rough kind of a business that most people wouldn't think about on their own without me, they are the ones that are essential, that could flip to virtual consultations or a virtual platform. Um, they're not businesses that owners are really struggling, stressed out, trying to figure out how are we going to get by this year. Thank God. I'm just, I'm thankful that most of the people that I've helped are in that position where even if they were forced to close, once they reopened, their customers came back and mm. they're right back to work and, and um, almost life as usual, <laughs> as, as much as they can be right now in 2020. <laughs> right. You know, that, that's, that's really interesting. Especially, could you give us some examples of of those type of businesses that you're referring to, like oh, sure. uh, that's really intriguing. That you you put you you called it out being essential, and some of it can even be done virtually. Okay, great. Um, I'll give you some great examples. So, one business that I place a lot of people into is a residential maid service business or light commercial cleaning company. So right now, everybody's sensitive, right, to clean, mm -hmm. and yeah. those businesses that are essential that maybe had a cleaning company coming in once a week to empty the garbage. Well, now they need to be cleaned deeper on a more regular basis to protect the employees. So there's a huge need for residential, I'm sorry, for light commercial cleaning right now. And even residential, everybody wants their houses clean, but that's going to be essential no matter what, right? I'm mm -hmm. a working mom. I, I want support in my house. I pay to have my house cleaned. 
hopefully forever. <laughs> right. So now I um, like, for example, a flooring company that I work with, that's a mobile showroom flooring company. So there's no big retail showroom. You don't carry any inventory. You don't have a lot of um, employees or a lot of hours. You that's the whole like normal deal with the franchise is that we're going to bring the showroom into the customer's home with a design associate, and then you're going to order direct from the manufacturer through the franchise or get great pricing, and then you're going to work with the best flooring subs in the area. You're going to build a relationship with them, and they're going to come in and do the work. So those consultations could be flipped to virtual quite easily. The same mm-hmm. thing with like Budget Blinds is a window treatment company. We I do that. Tailored Living, which does California or a Cal. California closets, those types of businesses could all be done the same way. And when people found themselves stuck at home, we saw a huge increase in home projects, in mm-hmm. junk removal, another business I do a ton of business in. Um, so things that everybody was home looking at their closets and their garages and organizing spaces. They had time. We all had time to do the stuff that we put off. And so these franchisees have seen major increases in almost every home services space. Those franchisees have grown this year. So, and that's just a space that historically over the 18 years I've been a consultant, I've helped a lot of people get into those types of businesses. And the last thing I'll say is in some of these trade businesses, someone might think, well, do I have to be the painter to own a painting company or do I have to have a master plumber's license or electrician license? And the answer is no, you don't. So when you buy into the franchise, you're buying the business side of the business, meaning the sales and marketing side. So perhaps you've heard of a company called Serta Pro Painters. Yeah. Okay, so Serta Pro is the largest painting company in North America. Now, the average franchisee does like, according to their FDD, like over $1.2 million in gross revenue, but doesn't paint anything. So they have a business that is full time going out in the community bidding on commercial and residential paint jobs. So a small team of a small sales team going out every day, bidding on jobs, winning customer trust and credibility and rapport, getting those jobs, and then finding the best Joe Painter guy out there who will come in and do what he's great at, which is the trade. Now, the trade off for him is he's not so good working with the customer stereotypically. It's, it's part of the business he generally doesn't like. And for him and his business, when he's out painting a job, he's not bidding on another job. So his life is very feast or famine. So when he comes in and starts working with the Serta Pro franchisee, he gets to move from project to project to project and have consistent income, right? And and, and job after job after job for the Serta Pro franchisee, they just get to be out bidding on jobs, winning jobs, marketing for new jobs, and then managing those contractors coming in to do the work. And that's why the franchise can do, you know, multi-million dollars in biz in revenue, while the mom and pop trade guy who's trying to sell a job and then paint a job can't figure out maybe how to do a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars a year in revenue. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I wanted to call out a couple of things that you just mentioned there that I think as real estate investors, we can take a lesson from. One of them was is that a lot of these, some of these franchisee, franchises that you're talking about and referring to, they have found a way to adapt to this environment. They've found a way to make themselves essential and or virtual. And it kind of reminds us like um, we have, a, I have a few rental properties and with the COVID and some of the lockdowns and everything, you know, I've had to adapt my way on how we handle showings even on on some of that stuff. So where there's a will, there's a way. And just because your market might be shut down, you you have to consider alternatives. I I really, really think that's that's important. Um, And then you you talked about the 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 franchisee, you know, like the, the paint service. You know, you, you you know you're probably not the best tradesperson. You but you might be great at this business in in some way, and you're focusing your efforts on what you're good at or what you enjoy doing. 
in my situation, I really enjoy talking to those people who need help when it comes to selling properties. So there's there's a lot there's a lot of lessons involved in what you were talking about there that uh, I just wanted to call out that you can take and make applicable to real estate. Yeah, and one thing well, we were talking any business about, for that matter for any business exactly it's true yeah. and that's why franchise when people question like the fees and how do franchisees afford to pay fees they can afford afford to pay fees because franchisees should be able to build significantly bigger businesses because you have infrastructure from day one that entrepreneurs have to stop and create infrastructure being a proven marketing plan being technology that may help you run your business remotely or right. um, even just run your business, like have digital media or have a backend software to manage inventory, or maybe it's um, uh, like a tracking device to know where, if you have a multi-truck pest control operation, to be able to know with GPS tracking where every truck in your fleet is and how long it's taking them to go from, from customer to customer so that you can manage the efficiencies of your routes. So good franchisors prepare that type of technology. So when you're the franchisee coming in, you just get to start your business with all of that goodness versus an entrepreneur in a pest control business who may never have that, right? Because you have to stop and create that. And that's not the part that makes you money. The part that makes you money is finding customers who want their houses, you know, sprayed for pests, if you will, right? right. So that's the, but those efficiencies are what drive higher revenue for the owner and also drive the idea that an owner can work on the business rather than in the business. And this is something that we talked about coming into the conversation, Jack, about semi-absentee ownership. I work mm -hmm. a lot with investors who have full-time jobs and who are like, Kim, I love the idea of diversifying into franchising, but I mean, I got to pay my mortgage, so I need to keep my job. Well, great. So there are franchises like a laundromat. I mean, how much time is that going to take you once it's built, right? right. There are franchises like um, an, a shared office space, right? Where again, you it's almost like being the landlord of, um, it is like being the landlord of a shared space. And um, once your business owners come in and take up, you know, a tenant, become tenants of, of your shared office space, you're just collecting rent. And you might have one or two employees managing these types of investments for you during the day-to-day -day business hours while you're at your job and you're overseeing the manager. And this is a great way for people that are in real estate investing to consider franchising still while keeping their full-time W-2 employment. Sure. No, and, and if you are interested in what Kim is talking about here, I wanted to remind everybody to make sure you go to thedailycoach.com. And daily is D-A-L-Y. Uh, so don't don't sneak in that I in there. <laughs> thedailycoach.com. And uh, I know you're available also pretty active on some of the social medias, including LinkedIn. That seems to be the popular one for a lot of my guests lately. But yes, I love LinkedIn. I post regularly. I was just posting right before we got on this podcast tonight. Yep. So, but you, you were talking about, you know, doing this, this passively to a certain extent, but how important is it to get into a franchise that you actually know a little bit about or have some kind of interest in it? I mean, okay. I, 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 I've never done pesticide or pest, <laughs> pest control, for example. No. That's something that I probably wouldn't gravitate towards. Okay. So a lot of the people who come to me believe that when we start our conversation, they have to know something about the business in order to be successful and or they have to have a passion for the widget. But after they work with me, they end up buying business businesses they know nothing about and really aren't that passionate about the widget. <laughs> so, I mean, when you look at a business, a franchise business is a vehicle. So what we're going to do is define what do you want in your life? When you look out down the road, three years, five years, 10 years from now, what is that vision that you see? And how does this franchise business help you get there? Is it a full-time? Is it part-time? Is it absentee? 
So, and when you get into it, are you starting out full time and transitioning to semi absent? Are you, you know, so we're going to look at that road that you're trying to travel. And then we're going to define the characteristics like, are you looking to get in on the pioneering end of something that's not a brand yet, but that has the potential to become the next American thing? And in five or seven years, when the whole world wakes up and everybody wants one and there's no more territory where you live, you can put a great exit strategy or a good resale value on your business and say, hey, there's no more territory, but you can buy mine and you can exit for some multiple of what you've built. Um, mm -hmm. and then there's the, the idea that you may invest in a business more for the long term. This is something I hope to do for the next 10 years or so. And so I wanted to have that sustainability. So we look at the characteristics of the business we look at what you want and need the business to do for you. We look at the role. Are you a salesperson? Are you the manager of people? Like, do you want to wake up every day and be directly influencing your customer? Or do you want to be leveraged through a team of employees? So we look at how you're going to spend your time, even how you're going to dress. Do you want to be in a business to business environment where maybe you wear a suit sometimes or, you know, you're more business casual? Or do you want to work from home or be more in a trade business where you're in jeans and a company polo shirt. So we talk through those kind of characteristics because at the end of the day, most people work in industries that they sort of fell into, right? Mm -hmm. And they use their job to get an outcome for their life. And the business, the investment can be used exactly the same way. Now, there are also those people who say, nope, I'm not putting my money into it unless I'm passionate about it, but I can almost guarantee you, if you go through the process and you start talking to other owners, you will fall in love with businesses that from the outset, you would scratch your head and go, I don't think I could ever be passionate about this. I mean, I have people that literally are passionate about junk, passionate about porta potties, passionate about cleaning services, because when they look at the ROI, when they look at the sustainability, when they look at the role that they play, when they look at the track record of the franchise, all of these things start to add up and tell a story to them that says, this is an amazing investment and that's what they're looking for. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, one of the things that uh, that struck me too is that you know we early on we talked about mentorship and and when it comes to real estate investing, what are your odds? Can you talk a little bit about like if you get involved in a franchise? I would suspect that your chance of success is higher than if you're starting a business from scratch and trudging it on question. your own. Yes. So every franchise, franchising is a regulated industry by the Federal Trade Commission. So every business that we look at will disclose to you, will, will give you their franchise disclosure document. And in the, this federally mandated document that comes out every year with all their updated information about everything that you're buying, bankruptcies in the company, um, or bankruptcies by the executive team, litigation in the company, the track record of the company. So you can see their historical track record and see, oh, okay, so over the last five years, 94% of their franchisees stayed in business. So then the question I, as I'm coaching candidates, is why are you going to be in the 6% of the people that didn't work out for versus the 94% that did? Or maybe it's 98% were successful and only 2% failed. But you're not going to take my word for being successful. I'm going to teach my candidates how to go out and interview those franchisees who are successful and people say, well, why are those franchisees going to talk to me? Well, because that's what we do in franchising. We are people helping people. We're all shareholders in the same brand. So when I share my success with you and that helps you get out of the gate motivated and inspired and maybe get up the learning curve faster because you can use my hindsight, that makes my brand stronger and that ultimately benefits me right? Mm -hmm. So this, this is what we call validation. It's a very important part of the franchise due diligence process where you 
our candidates get to go out and validate in the real world how this business is operating and when did you cash flow and how many customers did it take and you know what was your biggest challenge and knowing what you know now if you could start all over what would you do differently i mean that's that's gold right mm -hmm. that an entrepreneur only wishes he had and he only has it after he's made all the mistakes right and then he decides to go build a second location or try to replicate his business in another in another you know territory or something all on his own but here in franchising we, we have the learning curve of all of the other franchisees who've come before us so it's a major advantage and yes ultimately you are buying down that learning curve and you're buying down the risk because you're partnering yourself with people who've already done it yeah that, what you've just said there i hope people were taking notes because that pertains to any business you could possibly ever consider getting into. Talking to those people and actually asking questions of those people that have already been there and done that. And it sounds the most obvious thing anybody could ever think of. But frankly, it's shocking how little that happens. Right. You know, yeah. I, that's, that's well, people really, think I'm going to bother them. And I'm like, no, no, no. In franchising, just wait. When you say yes and you become a franchisee, you're going to have to do some validation calls. <laughs> so you might as well do it now and be able on the re be on the receiving end because soon enough, if you say yes, you're going to be the giver. <laughs> right. You mentioned yeah. early on that you'd really have to talk to people to see what would be a good fit and, and what kind of money would be involved in getting into a franchise. Can you give us a little idea of like um, how little could you get in to some some franchise and like sure. what have you seen the most like what level of investment whether it's money or and or time okay so um, money and time are inversely related in this equation so the more money a business requires from the owner typically the less time from day one so for example, my primo business is the self storage, climate controlled storage, right? Like mm. the people that build those things are like $5 million investments, right? They are not, they are never working in their storage facility, right? That is basically a great tax write off business and just a long term residual earner for them. Okay. Mm. So big investment of money, low investment of owner time. On the other end of that extreme, we have my pure sales-driven entities that are home-based businesses. Now, home-based doesn't mean that you're working from home necessarily. What it means is I don't need to take on the overhead of a location somewhere because I'm willing to be mobile. I'm willing to go out and do business where my customers are at their business, right? So that means you don't have to have a lot of stuff to get started. And so it might just be a franchise fee of maybe 30, 40, $50,000. Those are kind of standard franchise fees today. A franchise fee is kind of the cost of entry. That's the fee that you pay to buy access to the business plan, the initial training, vendors, technology, ongoing support. That kind of opens the gate to Disneyland and mm -hmm. gets you in, right? And then right. and then there's some working capital to go out there and establish those first few accounts and kind of whatever you have to do to get your business going. Mm -hmm. So there are businesses that are definitely 10 or 20 or $30,000. And then there are those that are like, you know, three, four, five million dollars. I'd say right. for me, I mean, again, I don't like talking about money because it makes people not call me. And, they, and there's always financing, right? So there's like a liquidity number, then there's a net worth number. So you know what? I'm not even going to give it to you. I'm sorry. I'm going to just wait. I'm not going to tell you what my average is because if someone is interested, again, I want the opportunity to educate you on what your money will buy and explain in greater detail this trade off of money for time. So you can see. So the difference is like an entrepreneur who has the dream to open a gym may spend three to five years getting that one gym, the marketing right, the employees right, the equipment purchases right, right, and getting it going and profitable. I can take a multi-unit mindset and a franchisee and he can open five locations in five years. So mm -hmm. the wealth is created through that scale right? But that doesn't mean, so how do people afford that? That doesn't mean that he's, if it costs 
250,000 to get one open. He's literally going 250,000, 250, right? It means like, it's like raising kids. The first one is kind of the one that people have to fund out of pocket or maybe like through a 401k rollover or a home equity line of credit or with an SBA loan. But then like they start kind of raising themselves, you know, like the landlords often will give tenant improvement money right? So you're improving their property. So they may share in some of those build out costs. So at the end of your construction project, let's say they cut you, let's say your construction project was 150 and they cut you check for 75. So when you go to bill number two and the bank says, well, you need to put the first, you know, 20% in cash. And let's say it's around 80 grand. Well, there's your 75 back from your tenant improvement money. And they come in and they write the construction loan on number two and they continue like that right? So you can take someone with a, you know, an average of, you know, million dollar net worth, let's say with maybe a hundred thousand liquid and they could easily, depending on the business, probably get approved for like a three store deal, a two store deal, or maybe even a five store deal, depending on the unit economics of each deal and depending on their credit score. And then of course, depending on their income to debt ratio. And so that's why these things make it complicated to be able to answer that question. Like, in a format like this. Does that make sense? No, that makes perfect sense. And I, I knew I was putting you on the spot, but you, you answered it well. I, I, uh, you sometimes question whether you should ask those type of questions, but I know people are in the back of their mind are thinking that, you know, I know everybody wants to know well, how much does it cost? And I'm like, well, it depends what you're buying. It depends. It, it so depends. if you want a laundromat, you know, and you don't want to work it, you've got to build out the laundromat with the electrical and the plumbing, and you've got to have the right amount of equipment in there that fits the demographic of the environment and the, of the community. And that's why you do it with a franchise, right? So that, again, that's a bigger investment of money, but it's like less than five hours a week of the owner's time. You know, mm-hmm. and then something that's smaller, like my sort of pro painter example, where the owner is going to be part of that initial sales team and be out driving that activity. So they're working it full time from the beginning. You know, that may be a hundred thousand all in with a franchise fee and some marketing money and off you go and maybe buying one sort of pro truck in the beginning and then scaling those trucks as your um, contra- as you grow your number of contractors and the number of uh, paint jobs that you're selling and out painting every day, right? So mm-hmm. you're able to more scale the business with expenses as your customers start showing up. Mm-hmm. But so I another go question: through all of this. So I, and this is, now we're going to come from another angle. And I, I you, you, if you uh, say that's not my expertise, I, I completely understand. But there's probably some people out there who have always who've thought to themselves that they have a business that they want to franchise. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that something you can help them with or point them in the right I'll direction? I'll help talk you out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's like the funniest question. People will call me, well, I have this great idea and I want to franchise it. And I'm like, well, first of all, why do you want to be a franchisor? And then they're like taken back. Like, well, what do you mean? Like, don't you help build franchises for a living? And I'm like, yeah, but that doesn't mean that like I will wish that upon you. The reason I say that is when you are a franchisor, all right, think about this. Let's say that you award 50 franchises, right? So you have 50 first time business owners who have their life savings invested in your business. Hmm. Have I said enough already? <laughs> yeah, I can understand so, that. They're like teenagers. I have two of them. No matter how much you do, it's never enough. <laughs> and hmm. when it's going good, they want all the credit. And when it's not, you are the blame. <laughs> So I tell people, look, if you want growth, just go, you know, get a little private equity fund and like do it that way. Save yourself the stress. But, you know, you know, obviously franchising is a way to grow a brand using other people's money. And it does have some huge advantages. You very quickly realize in franchising that being the franchisor, there's a lot of money to be made when you're collecting a royalty of, say, on average, 7 percent from, you know, 100 people or 200 people of their gross revenue, and then you're just helping them drive more revenue, obviously you can make a lot of money. But it right. absolutely does not, com- it absolutely doesn't come for free. It comes with a lot of headaches. Sure. <laughs> so I dare you to call me and tell me you want me to help you franchise your business. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that's a that's a good place to to start wrapping things up here. Uh, you've convinced me to to avoid it already. <laughs> 
So with that being said, Kim, I always end end our show with uh, one simple question. Is there a question you wished I would have asked you here tonight? I think you asked some really good questions. I want to make sure that your investor audience really understands that franchise, a franchise is an investment. You, you build it, you own it, and you can sell it for, a, for an, with an exit strategy, some multiple of what you've built. The less time the business requires of you at the time that you sell it, the higher the multiple can be. So I've seen people that I have a friend in Planet Fitness who owned 10 locations, which that's a manager run type of a franchise. And he was paid an eight multiple of Mm -hmm. his net earnings times 10 clubs to go away. He's 58 years old and he's a very wealthy man. (laughs) So that's, he got in 18 years ago when Planet Fitness was just getting started. He rode the wave with the brand as it grew and he sold at kind of the peak of its value probably. So there's many different ways to be involved as a real estate investor and it can be full-time, it can be part-time in the semi-absentee role. And I just want to make sure that that's very clear. There are also great tax advantages to franchise. I know real estate investors love real estate because of the tax advantages. And those are things that we can talk about as well and how they would pertain to you and your current situation and the business that we may be looking at for you. So, And if you want more information, please make sure you head over to Kim's website, thedailycoach.com. That's D-A-L-Y coach.com. Find Kim on LinkedIn and all the social medias. Um, And uh, I really appreciate your time here tonight. This This was a great conversation. And like I said, we haven't delved into this before. So I hope we can uh, maybe chat uh, again sometime. Absolutely. It's always a pleasure to be a guest. Thank you so much. Thank you. This has been the REI Mastermind Network. You can already tell that we've made some changes and a few more are on the way. If you are interested in what we have planned, head over to patreon.com slash REI Mastermind and support the show today. Financial contributions are always appreciated, along with a like, share, and review. It really helps us grow and reach more people with this valuable information. See you next time and tell a friend.